I'm Lynn. Recently, I got married to my husband, Scott, and now I have a sister-in-law named Abigail, but I just got this weird call from her. Lynn, you listening? I am, but I didn't quite catch that. Okay, I'll say it again. Your cruiser? I crashed it into an iceberg. Yeah, still doesn't make sense. Needless to say, there's a lot to unpack here. First off, I don't own a cruiser. And what's this about an iceberg? You wouldn't see icebergs unless you're near the Arctic or Antarctic. We're in Los Angeles, so I doubt there's an iceberg nearby. But knowing Abigail, she probably doesn't realize that. She's a bit different in many ways. She's either confused about something or trying to tease me, one of the two. Thinking this, I asked Abigail again. Did you really crash into an iceberg? Yeah, I intentionally hit the iceberg and sank it. <laughs> Abigail answered laughing. Annoyed by her tone, I asked her a bit more sternly. Can you explain a bit more? <laughs> Lynn, you're so silly. Fine, I'll explain. Abigail started her explanation, still laughing. Her story began when I visited Scott's family home. The reason for going to Scott's place was simple. We had a family meeting. Naturally, Abigail was there, too. As soon as she saw me, she said, Well, you look kind of Japanese. My grandma's Japanese. My grandma is Japanese, and my grandpa is American. Their daughter, my mom, married an American, my dad, and they had me and my brother. Later, when I was in upper elementary school, we moved to Birmingham, Alabama, due to my father's job. My appearance is a bit different from typical Americans, more East Asian, like Japanese. I've been teased about it a few times, so I was a bit on guard, thinking Abigail might do the same. But Abigail just said, Really? That's so cool. You're really cute. She complimented me like that. In a moment, I felt relieved. What if they hadn't accepted me? That's what I had been worrying about. Thank you. Looking forward to getting along. Sure thing. That's how I talked with Abigail, and then Victoria, my soon-to-be mother-in-law, joined the conversation. Lynn, you lived in Los Angeles, right? Do you still have a house there? The house we lived in is occupied by someone else now, but we do have relatives' homes there. Oh, I see. But as long as you have relatives' homes there, no need to worry. Victoria seemed oddly pleased. Then Abigail chimed in. That's what I was thinking, too. I had a bad feeling about this, but an opportunity to travel with Victoria and her family isn't likely to come up often, so I didn't make much of it and let the conversation flow. However, Victoria and Abigail kept asking odd questions afterwards about the kind of house I lived in in Los Angeles, the kind of car I drove. Finally, they even asked about my relatives' homes in Los Angeles. I replied that I lived in a house with a pool and my uncle lives by a river. Hearing this, Victoria and her group laughed maliciously. <laughs> That's when I realized they were planning to use my relatives to take a trip to the West Coast. Oh no, they're planning to take full advantage of me. But it's hard to complain to people you just met, and complaining might jeopardize their acceptance of the marriage. After much thought, I decided to bear it for now. After all, the chance to go to the West Coast wasn't immediate. By the time it came around, we'd probably be in a position to have a proper discussion. For the moment, I decided not to touch on the subject. Somehow, I managed to get through the introductions. At the end, Abigail asked for my contact information, which I regretfully shared. That was a big mistake. After that, she started contacting me more frequently, at first, it was about once a week, so I just went along with it or declined casually. But gradually, she began to reach out more often. It became a hassle, and I started making convenient excuses like being at work or driving. Once Scott and I filed our marriage application, Abigail became completely unreserved. I tried to accommodate her a few times, but twice or thrice a week was just too much. And yet today, she called again, saying, Hey, Lynn. Want to hang out? It's already 8 p.m. I have work tomorrow. What? You can't make it work, right? No, I can't. 
Abigail finished high school and works part-time. She probably has more free time, but I'm a full-time employee. I work weekdays from Monday till evening, and my only days off are the weekends and the holidays. Now that I'm married, I have household responsibilities, too. I just don't have the leisure to accommodate Abigail. Sorry, I have a meeting early tomorrow morning. Stingy, even though you're rich. With those words, the call ended. Since then, I haven't heard from Abigail. What's this about being rich? I work full time, but it's not like I earn a high salary. I couldn't make sense of it. The next day, I got a call from Victoria. Lynn, want to go shopping together? Um, I'm pretty busy with work, I replied nonchalantly. Then Victoria said something strange. You're rich, right, Lynn? I wanted to consult you about some brands I'm interested in. Wait, did I just hear something odd? Something about being rich? Wondering if I misheard, I asked Victoria to clarify. Sorry, did you just say something about being rich? Uh-huh, yes, I did. What about it? I'm not rich. What? But you lived in Los Angeles, right? Victoria said, as if it were the most natural thing. Does living in Los Angeles automatically make one rich? If that logic holds, does it mean all Los Angeles residents are wealthy? All these thoughts were swirling in my head. As I sighed, <sighs> Victoria asked, What's wrong? Just a misunderstanding. I'm not rich. What? Even though you lived in a house with a pool? That's common in California. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I must have misunderstood. With those words, Victoria abruptly hung up. I was left puzzled. What was that all about? No matter how much I thought about it, I couldn't find an answer. When I discussed this with Scott, he talked to Victoria and Abigail for me. According to Scott, here's what happened. Learning that I lived in Los Angeles, and specifically in a house with a pool, they assumed it must be in Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills means wealth, so they concluded I must be wealthy. Indeed, if one lives in Beverly Hills, it's not unreasonable to think they might be well off. But I just lived in Los Angeles, not Beverly Hills. So Victoria and her group's assumption were flawed. But they believed what they thought, hence the probing about my house. I did find it odd when they asked me those questions, but I couldn't lie. So I told the truth, which unfortunately fed their misconceptions. A house with a pool might be common in California, but it's almost unheard of here in Birmingham. It seems Victoria and her group misunderstood and thought I was wealthy. They probably thought being rich means they could benefit from my marriage. They could expect money gifts from me. Anyway, if I cozy up to them, something good might come of it. That seems to be what they were thinking. That's why they were contacting me so often. Eventually, Scott clarified the misunderstanding, but Victoria and her group seemed to grumble about it. Well, if I had been a rich girl, maybe we could have gone on trips or partied every night. I can understand their disappointment when all that became impossible. But still, it was good that the misunderstanding was cleared up. Sometime later, when I went to discuss the wedding plans with Victoria's family, if the misunderstanding had persisted, Victoria would have wanted a lavish wedding. But she actually said to me, What kind of wedding are you planning? You're not going for something too extravagant, right? Yeah, I think a small family-only affair would be nice. Right. You have to be mindful of expenses now. She seemed concerned, which was nice. However, Abigail still seemed to have her doubts about me. She didn't participate much in the wedding discussion, which was a bit disappointing. But even without Abigail's input, our wedding was still happening. A year later, we managed to have a lovely wedding. On the wedding day, my parents, who live in Birmingham, managed to make it in time for the ceremony. But my grandparents from Los Angeles couldn't come due to the difficulty of travel. Instead, my Uncle Taylor, my mother's brother, came. He said he would take pictures to show to my grandparents. As I was waiting in the dressing room a few hours before the ceremony, Taylor came to see me. 
Lynn, how are you doing? Taylor's company deals with boat rentals, handling cruisers and pleasure boats, popular among young Americans. He showed me a photo saying, look at this, I bought it. It was a cruiser in the photo, clearly expensive at a glance. How much? Um, this much. Taylor typed a number on his phone. Three million dollars? What? It seemed he didn't catch what I said. Taylor has some hearing issues due to an accident in his youth, and speaking a bit louder helps him understand better. As I was marveling at how he could afford such a sum, Taylor showed me another photo. Lynn, this is a wedding present for you. For me? It was a picture of a pleasure boat. According to Taylor, his company had recently replaced some boats. He had kept one of them aside for me. It was currently at his riverside home, and I could use it when I visited. Thank you. While I was talking about this, Abigail entered the dressing room. What's this? What did you get? Abigail had a sly smile on her face. Seems like she was eavesdropping outside the dressing room. If I tell Abigail about the pleasure boat, she'll definitely insist on being taken for a ride, so I'd rather not tell her. But it seems she already overheard, so it might be hard to hide it. Reluctantly, I said, Taylor gave me a boat. A boat? Who just gives away a boat like that? It's a second-hand boat from Taylor's company. Instead of disposing of it, he gave it to me. Huh, interesting. Abigail didn't seem very interested. In a way, that was a relief. After Taylor left the room, I moved in front of the mirror to do my makeup. Glancing through my mirror, I noticed Abigail looking at the photo Taylor had brought. Maybe she's more interested than she lets on. As I was thinking this, Abigail had disappeared. Soon after, the wedding was over. On the way back in the car, Victoria said to me, Lynn, did you inform Grandma about your marriage? Of course I did. I even sent her photos of my wedding dress. That's good, but don't you think it would be better to visit her? Uh, as I was fearing this turn of events, Victoria continued, I'd like to greet your Grandpa and Grandma, too. But they're in Los Angeles. That's why I was thinking, why don't we combine it with a family trip to the West Coast? It seems Victoria hadn't given up on the trip idea. It was a hard proposition to refuse. As I was thinking about how to decline, Victoria said, Actually, I talked to Taylor. What? With Taylor? Yes, and he said he'd love for us to visit. Did Taylor catch that and all the noise? Huh? That's something you overcome with willpower. I'm pretty sure Taylor didn't get it. So I refused, not wanting to inconvenience Taylor. Then Victoria frowned suddenly. Oh, poor Grandpa and Grandma. Couldn't attend the wedding. Can't see their grandchild. Please don't say it like that. Don't you want to see them? I do, but... See? Then let's go. In the end, I couldn't refuse. Pushed by Victoria, we decided to go to the West Coast for our honeymoon. But I wasn't unhappy about it. I would get to see Grandpa and Grandma after a long time, and we could play in the river near Taylor's house. There's also the pleasure boat, so it's sure to be fun. Might as well enjoy it to the fullest. With that mindset, I decided to go have a good time. A few months after the wedding, we used our summer vacation to travel to the West Coast. When I explained the situation to Taylor, he happily agreed to host us. So, Scott, Victoria, Abigail, and I headed to Taylor's house in Los Angeles. Father-in-law couldn't join due to work commitments. Still, it was our first family trip since getting married. I wanted to use this opportunity to bond with Victoria and Abigail. That was my plan. The day we arrived was spent joyfully reuniting with Grandpa and Grandma and introducing Scott to them. I also introduced Victoria and Abigail, and we all enjoyed a family party. Abigail, with her inherent cheerfulness, quickly got along with Taylor's family. Victoria seemed to be having fun, too. And we felt a step closer to being a real family. That's what I thought. The next day, my brother Kevin, who lives alone in San Francisco, came to visit late in the morning. 
Lynn. Kevin, how's school? For context, Kevin is a college student. It's the weekend, right? I'm off, so I came to say hello. I'll introduce you to Scott and the others. We talked, but I couldn't find Victoria and Abigail anywhere. Scott, who was helping my aunt, was there, but not Victoria and her group. Scott, where are Victoria and the others? I don't know. Scott shrugged. That's when I suddenly got a call from Abigail. Hello, Lynn. Abigail, where are you? My brother just arrived. Before I could finish, Abigail burst into laughter. <laughs> You're so laid back, Lynn. What's going on, Abigail? Do you know where we are? I was just looking for you. Where are you? That's a secret. Just wanted to tell you something. Tell me what? Your cruiser. I deliberately crashed it into an iceberg and sank it. <laughs> Abigail laughed loudly. That was the extent of what Abigail explained over the phone. So that's what happened. Got it? I understood the story, but what about my cruiser? Thinking it over, I remembered something. From the wedding day, Taylor had given me a pleasure boat. That time, Abigail was eavesdropping on our conversation. She saw the photo of the cruiser and heard me talking about getting a boat, so she might have been confused. Then I tried clarifying. You know, if it's my boat, it's at my house. The pleasure boat I received is at Taylor's house. I'm not sure of it since I glanced at it. No, no, it's different. Your cruiser sank right in front of me. It's hard to say, but I don't own a cruiser. What? There was a photo. You were talking about the boat being a gift. The boat I received was the pleasure boat. Pleasure what? Right, Abigail is a bit different. She wouldn't know the difference between a pleasure boat and a cruiser. A pleasure boat is for fun, and a cruiser is for staying overnight. What do you mean? It means the cruiser you're talking about sinking isn't mine. What? Whose cruiser is it then? That's what I wanted to know. But from her talk about the photo, it's probably Taylor's cruiser. As I was thinking this, I heard Taylor screaming over the phone, shouting things like, What have you done? And what's going on? Then I realized, Abigail must take it for my cruiser and had sunk Taylor's $3 million cruiser. Abigail, don't move. Why? What's wrong? This is Los Angeles. Not some rural area like Alabama. Sinking a boat and running away is a big deal here. Really? Yes, police here deal with serious crimes. They're not like the sheriffs in Alabama. You understand? Oh, no. I could hear Abigail crying. She seemed to be pleading with Victoria nearby. Mom, help me. I don't know, Abigail. You did it on your own. Help me. I just wanted to be on the cruiser. It seemed like they were passing the blame to each other. Well, as long as they stay put, that's fine. I quickly contacted Scott and headed to the marina where Taylor's cruiser was. The marina was a few minutes drive away. Arriving at the scene, several police officers were already there. I talked to a stunned Taylor. He told me this. Early in the morning, Abigail and Victoria had asked him to go on the cruiser but their strong Alabama accent made their English hard to understand. Taylor thought that's what they wanted from their difficult-to-understand English. Meanwhile, I asked Abigail for her side of the story, and she said, I kept telling Taylor to let me on Lynn's cruiser. You actually said that? He didn't quite understand me. Well, I see. So I kept repeating Lynn's cruiser to Taylor. I think I get what she's trying to say but I doubt that would get the message across. So I checked with Taylor about what he heard. He said, Lisa Cruiser. Now that I think about it, the pronunciation isn't too far off. And with Abigail's strong Alabama accent, it's not surprising it was misheard. But leasing implies long-term rental. Normally, one would refuse such a request. But Taylor had realized last night that Abigail was a bit unusual. She kept repeating, Lisa Cruiser. 
Taylor, out of kindness, thought she wanted to borrow a cruiser. As a result, he let Abigail onto his own cruiser, and she misunderstood it as mine. That seems to be what happened. But why did you want to sink my cruiser? I thought you lied about not being rich, getting cruisers and stuff. She thought I was actually rich enough to receive a cruiser, but was hiding it. Abigail wanted to get back at me for lying. Even if it was out of jealousy or feeling lied to, sinking a cruiser is too extreme. But I still had questions, so I asked her, How did you manage to operate the cruiser? You don't have a boating license, do you? I just kind of figured it out by watching Taylor. So you guessed? Yeah, I fiddled around and it started moving. And then? I couldn't stop it, crashed into the dock, and it started sinking. So I thought I might as well sink it. According to Abigail, her plan was just to cause a little trouble. But the cruiser moved more easily than expected and hit the dock. It then started sinking and she panicked. But her coming to me with this was infuriating. Yet, if left alone, it would become a huge problem, and she didn't think to call the police in her panic. How could she convey this situation to me and give me a scare? Abigail thought of this. There was a movie about a ship sinking after hitting an iceberg. She figured she could use that as a reference, saying it hit an iceberg would surely cause panic. Besides, that movie was a Hollywood film. Hollywood is in Los Angeles, so they couldn't have filmed it without nearby icebergs. Therefore, she assumed there must be icebergs nearby. With this bizarre and whimsical reasoning, Abigail lied about hitting an iceberg and sinking. Moreover, she thought if she said such a thing, I would be worried about her safety. Then she expected me to rush over in a panic. Seeing my panic state would be enough revenge for her. I understood why she lied about hitting an iceberg, but her reasoning was ludicrously flawed. Afterwards, both Abigail and Victoria got a scolding from Scott. Fortunately, there was no damage to other boats, so paying for the repairs settled the matter. And after all that, why do I have to work for a river cleaning company? Abigail cried in Birmingham. It's obvious. The repair costs were substantial. But there are other jobs. Well, you wanted to be on a boat, right? This river cleaning company lets you do just that. I wanted to be on a cruiser, not just any boat. In the end, Abigail was left crying while working for the river cleaning company, picking up trash from the boat. It was tough work, but ideal for her, who wanted to be on a boat. For me, there was a slight upside. Actually, Victoria started working, too, for Abigail's sake. This meant she stopped contacting me as much. Of course, I want to get along with them. But for now, it's important they work and earn money, especially for Taylor's sake. Otherwise, I'd be in trouble. After all, I haven't even been on that $3 million cruiser yet. <laughs>